Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Thank you. Back. Just raise your hand if you're in the back, please. Yes? Okay. I'll take this. Yes. So welcome everybody to tonight's uh, program. Uh, if I can have someone play the Madonna and the Cartels, please feel free. Same with Julia. Yes, Thank you. So it's nice to have all these uh, engaging emotions for this. So once again, thank you for uh, it's a real pleasure and honor to give class. Uh, no qualification. I don't have any qualification, but I've been asked to give class, and that's the only qualification I bring to you is that I'm asked for some say. So tonight's class, as I mentioned, is about a topic that uh, is actually affects all of you in one way or another. And uh, I'd like you to listen very attentively for the next five to ten minutes because you will see that this is something that all of you uh, would want to be engaged with. Uh, that is caring for someone else that's near, near and dear to you. So we'll look at it from the perspective of the Acharyas, the Vedas. Because Krishna, when you go to the uh, Holy Dham, you know, there's something called Stai Baba. Stai Baba means what is your original position, what is who you are, and to get into the Stai Baba, compassion or compassion for the devotees is the first criteria for that. So we'll explain why that is the case based on scriptures, and before we do that, we'll uh, do a little kirtan, okay? We'll do a little kirtan and then the Jarad Madhva, and then, um, and then the uh, opening prayers and the class. So this class will be going until about uh, 7 40 or so, so if you'll bear with me for about an hour, and then we'll have a video about the uh, V-Care program, the pioneers of the V-Care program, both uh, internationally, regionally, locally, and then uh, we also have a sign-up desk. So to the left of me, uh, the, the lead room is, uh, I think he's there. So there'll be a sign-up desk, and we ask all of you to think about this uh, wonderful volunteer opportunity, and you can sign up for this as well. Uh, towards the end of the program, and Mother, L Mother Lalita Priya is right here, so she's our leader, and we'll also uh, discuss a bit about that as well. Jen. Okay, so we'll start with Kirtan, because uh, Kirtan is essential for creating the mood for this class. Alright, so here we go. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare
God must rejoice with the foundation of the AC, but God does not wish to be the Jet. Jonas Rocker must rejoice with the foundation of the AC, but God does not wish to be the Jet. Jonas Rocker must rejoice with the foundation of the AC, Jet. Namacharya Shira Hadas Kapra Ki Jai Prem Sakam Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Siya Veta Katadara Svasati Gaur Bhakta Mi Ki Jai Sama Veta Bhakta Ki Jai Hitai Gaur Bhanandi Hari Hari Bo Hakuri Sivam Rodi Sari Krishna 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 Hakuri Sivam Rodi Sari Mukam Karoti Vacha Nam Pangam Ramayi Zikrim Vritu Prata Mahande Shri Guru Dina Tavim Shri Guru Chitin Devam Shri Guru Paramandana Madhavam So, what I'd like to do is, I just start with the slides. I'd like to just, so, for people that have read the, or are planning to read the Maha, the Shri Prabhupada Lina Rita, the Sleeva Ruta is a book that was uh, compiled by one of his early disciples, Sri so, 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 Goswami Maharaj. And it uh, used to be a six-part volume, if I remember correctly. I got my first one in 1983. That's when we were at the Ispan of our temple. And then subsequently I gathered the most recent volume, is seven volumes. But in one of the books, is called, the title is called The House in Which the Whole World Can Live. So Prabhupada, the founder of Charya, that's the preeminent guru, was, uh, you know, form is right there on the altar. The one who founded this movement back in 1966, in July 1966, was incorporated in New York City. So he helped build a house in which the whole world can live. And as we know, that there are many houses in this town. This house for daily worship, this house for prasad distribution, this house for food distribution, this house for housing de devotees, and there's a house of compassion. So we're going to talk about the house that he built, the house of compassion. And in Toronto, we also have this house of compassion. And in any house, there are basically four main foundations. Right? There's four foundations. I'm not an architect or builder, but I think, I think mostly, when you look at a square or rectangular building, there's usually four foundations. So it is said, now no credit to me, but it is said that in this house that we have, the one that I am very fortunate to be with is the Vishnu Care um, program in Istanbul, Toronto. There are four lives in this house. So it is said, I don't know who said it, um, I think Mark Payne might have said it, but he said that in every successful man, behind every successful man, there is a woman. So I want to, for all the classes that I've been able to give and all my service, I want you to vote first live in this house to my wife, Sachi Devi. So, and the second in this house of which we care is uh, my mother, Lalita Priya, who's right here. So she's the leading of this we care program. And as you'll come to know, there's a lot of sacrifice involved. I'm not saying that I'm doing sacrifice, but she's encouraging us to sacrifice. Going to Dwarty's homes, as you'll see going to hospitals under, you know, spending conditions and so forth. She stays a second leg of the house. A third leg of the house are two wonderful Vaishnavis, Mother Sangeetha Mataji, and the one who is closely following her lead, Mother Tarabali. So, and the are all as well. So Mother Tarabali is leading the mission she's getting trained, as we understand that Mother Sangeetha is going through some personal medical uh, difficulties. So, being a pure disciple, she Prabhupada, she's the best and most important uh, person to lead this uh, project and to train other people following her. And of course, the fourth foundation all, are all of you. So, without your presence and guidance and help, this is not possible. So, we need your help. I'm begging all of you to consider this initiative tonight that we're sharing with you. So, what is the initiative? Well, this initiative comes from, you know, Someone famously said, there was a journalist, uh, an American journalist, uh, who was covering real life World War II footage back in the 40s and 50s. And his name is Edmund Morrow. And he said that difficulty is excuse, history never excuses. I'll repeat that again. Difficulty is the excuse that history never accepts, pardon me, never accepts. That is that in devotional service, you will come across difficulties, but history will never accept that it's a difficulty. And similarly, in spiritual life, 
especially in certain areas, such as running a big festival, like the upcoming Rati Yatra, running a big festival generously, temple management, you know, making the shop and feast for large festivals, book distribution, uh, many other things, including Veshna care difficulties come about. But if Krishna never accepts that, then will the Lord accept that? You know, will he, will he, you know, accept the fact that because someone has a difficulty, you cannot go because you're tired or because you had some other thing that came across your path that wasn't so, such much, so much a priority. So let's, let's take an example of that and let's try to shed some more light into what that actually means. So recently we celebrated Ramnami. And there's many, many life morals to glean from this uh, wonderful tale of Ramnami. Right, so this is the appearance of Lord Ramachandra, the Sri Prasoni Goddard. It happened about a couple of weeks ago. And there's many, you know, parts of that story, but one part that relates to compassion for the vegetables, thank you for um, Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention, I'd like to also thank the management for giving us this uh, form. I'd like to also thank the people that helped me with the Kirtan, Radha Mahaprabhu and Julia, and anyone else that I missed as well. And for all of you clapping hands, thank you so much for that. So, in this, uh, this tale of the Ramayana, which is actually initially it was about one million verses. So, when Brahma spoke the Ramayana to Narayan Muni, it was actually one million verses. But he realized in this age of Kali, you don't have so much time. So, very mercifully, Valmiki, you know, uh, basically condensed it into 24,000 verses and into different khandas, these are sections, okay? So one khanda is called the Bal Khanda, which is the pastimes of Lord Ramachandra in his young life. And then the other one is when he goes to the forest, called the Aranyaka Khanda, okay? Aranya, Aran, Aran means battlefield, okay? Aranyaka means battlefield, for example, in Sanskrit. And Aran means there's no fight, okay? So this is another different time when there was a plan for the war against Ravan, that's the demon that basically had stolen Sita Devi, the speed personality is God's, you know, eternal consort. So, at that moment, what happened was that Ravan and Lakshman, his younger brother, did not know that Ravan had kidnapped Sita Devi. They had no clue where she was, they had sent all armies in all four directions, and looked and searched the entire length and width of the globe and could not find Sita. So it so happened that they came across these group of animals in this forest. And these animals were, you know, moving their heads and looking up towards the south, you know, pointing towards the south. And when they came towards the south, they saw this, you know, this very gross grotesque sight, a very grotesque sight. What happened at that site was well, there was all these flowers are strewn, garlands, earrings, you know, bracelets and like that. And there was this big black creature sitting in a mound of blood. A big black creature sitting in a mound of blood. And Ram could see that this there's some encounter, some very unfortunate encounter. And he then concluded that this personality of this creature that was sitting in this mountain of blood was the one who had actually stolen and killed Mother Sita. So what Rama wanted is that he took out his bow and arrow and pointed it towards this big black creature. So at that moment, a voice came out of this big black creature. He said, I am your servant to tell you. I am the friend of your father, Tasfat. And I am, you know, I I got your questions in the force of Panchavati when you were there with Mother Sita. And I'm the king of all the birds that served you in the forest. I'm the king of the birds. So please, you know, please spare me. And then he related that Ram Bhagwan put down his bow and arrow and rushed towards this, uh, this creature that actually was the breathing's last. Because in his encounter with Ram, Rama, he actually, you know, tried his best to save Sita Maya, uh, Sita Maya from this Rama. And he did everything he could to save Sita Maya. But he, he, you know, he was badly named and wounded to the point that he was going to give his life. So Rama wanted to rush to Jatayu's, you know, site and basically, you know, embraced him very tightly. And tears, he, he had a flood of tears coming out of his eyes. This is the person got it. And, and he said, you know, what happened? He explained the whole story. 
And he said that, you know, Ram Bhagavan said, I know that you're old, you know, he, he is a vulture, he's a king of the birds, he's actually a vulture. And he said that, I know that you had no chance against Ravan. You know, Ravan is a demon, you know, he's a very, very powerful demon. And he tried his best, he tried his best. He poked at him, took out some flesh from his uh, arms, you know, chopped out his arms, his beak and talons, his claws. And, but his arms and, you know, and go back, his heads go back. And eventually, Ram, you know, Ravan sliced him with his arrows very, very unmercifully, and he, and he left. And it says that actually the place where he fell is called uh, Lepakshi. Okay, so if you go to a place in Andhra Pradesh, there's a place called Lepakshi. So if anyone that speaks Telugu here, they means, you know, fall or rise up, rise up, or, and Pakshi means bird. So that place you can visit, that's actually where Jatayu fell from the sky in Andhra Pradesh. At that moment, he says that, now I fulfill my wish, but one thing that hurts me is that I do not die in this battle with Ravana. Why? Well, why is it Ravana going? He said that because, because I could have died and then I would not have to bear the separation that you and Sita are separated from each other. That is hurting me more than the sword of Ravana. No, I want to, I want one wish from you. And Ram and Ram, Ram, Ram said, what is that wish? He said that one wish is that ever I have to fight Ravana, I want to be killed in the battle. He said I want to be killed in the battle. And Ravana said, okay, I will grant you that wish, but before that, I have a question to ask you. He said, what is that question? He asked Atayu, he said, you knew that you stood no chance against fighting this powerful demon, Ravana, but you still fought, you know, you still fought. May I ask you why you, you did that? Okay, you had no chance. Because it's very really foolish for someone to enter a battle knowing that he will die, okay? But still, he entered that battle. So why would you do that? He explained that at the time that Ravana was passing over in his chariot with Sita, at that time there was a period of time called Mahurta. Okay, at that time there was called the Vindhya Mahurta. So the Vindhya Mahurta, Mahurta is 48 minutes. In Vedic calculation, a murta like we have the Brahma murta, which is the most auspicious time to do devotional service in the first thing in the morning, which is usually 96 minutes before sunrise. A murta is a unit of time. Okay? It's broken down into Mahurta and then Ahavaratma. And then if you divide a murta, it's called Gadi and so forth like that, Vimishena. You know, these are calculations of time, Pal, like that. Okay? You read all about it in the Manusmiti. Manusmiti is a book written by, you know, Manu. That's the manual for this age. So he written this, all these calculations in the Manasmiti. So Murta at that time was the Vindhya Murta. In the Vindhya Murta, whoever does any action is successful. So therefore, because Ravan called Sita, Jitai knew that he was going to be successful in the endeavor. So he fought for those 48 minutes. Okay? But he knew that the Murta immediately following that was called the Punur Vasu Murta. The Punur Vasu Murta. So the Punur Vasu Murta means that whatever you take comes back. Okay? So therefore I knew, Ram Bhagavan, that yes, Ram will take Sita, but you'll have to give it back. He'll have to give it back to you. So therefore I kept that Murta going because I wanted you, not me, to deliver my Sita back to you. Okay? And therefore I gave up my life, you know, like that. So what does that mean? That means that Jatayu, even though he knew that he was going to be defeated to a point that he would have to give his life, still thought of the Supreme Personality Godhead. And because of that reason, he got the direction of the Supreme Personality Godhead in the very final stage of life, you know? Ram Bhagwan embraced him very tightly. He had the beautiful Lord's face of Ram Bhagwan looking at him directly, looking at the eyes of Ram Bhagwan, and Ram Nam on his name, he left his body. It was such a glorious departure. So in that mood, we, sometimes as devotees, we, you know, get worried that, you know, I've been doing devotional service all my life, you know? And uh, what is the guarantee that I will remember the Lord at, this, at the time of death? Well, my dear friends, the thing is, the question that I ask you is that do you want to, you know, live, live basically trying to serve the Lord or worry about the time of death or leaving it up to Him to worry about what is going to be your departure at the time of death? If you serve the Buddha to tell you, then surely the Supreme Lord will make sure that your departure at the time of death will be full of Ram Nam 
Shagam in the presence of devotees and Shri Bhagavan will come and chant in here at the time of death. That is given in the Shastras, okay? So if you follow the, the, the method of Jatayu, then surely through the care program, you will also have a glorious depression of Jatayu. So that's the story that connects to Jatayu. There's many other things, but because of shorter time, maybe if you have time at the end, I'll go back to the story of Jatayu and just plan to see. So the story of Jatayu tells us one important fact. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, in the first canto, which is a book, and uh, I encourage all of you, if you don't have the Srimad Bhagavatam, or if you've not heard about it, at the end of this program, please visit the book stalls on the outside and ask them, what is Srimad Bhagavatam? Ask them what is Srimad Bhagavatam, and they will be more than happy to tell you what is Srimad Bhagavatam. Because all these stories that we hear are essentially in the Srimad Bhagavatam. So Srimad Bhagavatam, has you know many books and the first book is called the Canto, the first canto. In the first canto, in the chapter 8, verse 48, there's a wonderful verse that says, The devotees of the Lord are so forbearing that even though they are defamed, cheated, cursed, disturbed, neglected, or even killed, they're never inclined to avenge themselves. That is they never retaliate. A devotee's main aim is to please the Sri God, whether at the cost of the fact that they are cursed, whether the cost of the fact that they are hurt, whether the cost of the fact that they are detained, or even they have to give up their life. Devotees, the main goal is to please Krishna Sanai God. So the outline of tonight's class is based on what's called the mission of care. So back in uh, 2000, Mother Sangeeta Devi Dasi and her god sister Jasuniya Devi Dasi, both being medical people, they, under the guidance of Shri Prabhupada, founded the Veshra of Care, that's Counseling, Assistance, Resource, and Education. Uh, Mother Sangeeta currently resides in Philadelphia, and she came here at least a few times to Toronto to teach us this course about We Care, and she's gone around the world explaining that. So she took initiation, of, if I believe, back in LA in 1973, and since then she's been doing many, many wonderful things with devotees as a hospice care nurse, and a certified grief counselor. She's also the author of this book called The Final Journey. We have copies here, and I humbly request you to please uh, take one home. And if you run out of them, we will make sure that more books come to you. So this book called The Final Journey integrates her knowledge and teachings of hospice care for dying and how to get spiritual wisdom based on the teachings of Shiro Prabhupada. So this book tells you, you know, hand by hand, section by section, how to care for someone who's you know, in distress or leaving your body. Um, thank you, Prabhu. So the outline is uh, what is compassion? We'll talk briefly about what is meaning compassion. We'll focus on the verse in the scripture. Why is it important to us? Why are we even talking about compassion? We touched upon that briefly. And then also to share with you a video on the efforts of Nelson Gita and other things internationally. So next slide. So compassion is defined as being sympathetically aware of others' distress and a desire to alleviate it. So it's both things. That is, you are aware of the person's distress and you want to do something to alleviate it, according to the dictionary. Now, what did the teachers say, the Vedic teachers, as Charlie say? This book called The Nectar of Motion, and in that book it says, a person who is unable to bear another's distress is called a paradukutuki. That is one who bears or feels for someone that's distress. One who laments for the ignorance of others. Ignorance does not mean not knowing you know, what is the latest score, whether the Raptors will make it to the playoffs. They probably won't this year, they're not doing so well. But anyways, the point, the point is, ignorance is, is the fact that, they're, that ignorance means that they are coming back again in this mature world, the cycle of birth and death, like that, okay? And then Bhakti Thakur, who is the Sorry for the, the misspelling there. Bhakti Thakur, who is the spiritual grandmaster of Sri Prabhupada, in his book called the Jiva Dharma, which is called Eternal Nature, he says that it's a tenderness of the heart to the jivas, and that's called daya, or compassion. Next one. So I'll get someone to read. Would someone like to put their hand and read what's on this mix a little interactive? Matsi, would you like to read? Another one, then?
and then it has to cool by adding of this simple activities are this thing by the supremacy of the spring and the water enter into the darkness that is the reason of the harsh life but by the grace of this great son Anathmara he was also delivered by God and went back to and the purport by Shri Prabhupada, maybe uh, Julie can be that or something. Although his, friend, his father targeted him and would have killed him had he himself not been killed by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Pallad Maharaj begged pardon for him from the Lord. This favor was immediately granted by the Lord, and he went to who was delivered from the darkest region of hellish life, and he returned back home, back to Godhead, by the grace of his son. And next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Read all of it. Although the Lord is very compassionate upon suffering humanity, human beings are generally not very anxious to serve Him. The relationship is something like that between the Father and the Son. The Father is always anxious for the welfare of the Son, even though the Son forgets or neglects the Father. The word Anukampina is significant. The Lord is so compassionate upon the living entities that he comes himself into this world in order to benefit fallen souls. Whenever and wherever there is a decline in religious practice of Santa Bhagavata and a predominant rise in Arab religion, at that time I was myself. And that's really the key to chapter 4 text. Okay, thank you so much. So, what we understand here that there are many, many millions of years ago, there was a son and father. For people that are not so aware of the story, there's a father who's called Rani Kashidu, who's the biggest and greatest demon at that time, and his son, Pallad Maharaj, which is his, uh, his fourth and last son, who was a pure devotee. So, it so happened that they didn't have such a good relationship. You know, it's usually between the mother and the daughter-in-law, but this time it was actually the father and the son. So some people got very close to each other, you know? And this is no, not some, you know, this, you know, you know, you stole money, you know, this and like that, you took money, you didn't tell me, no. It was actually the height of, you know, atrocity. So Hirni Kashiku, his father, being very really powerful, he completely tortured his son in more ways than we can think. You know, he tried to murder him, slay him, put him on fire, throw him down a cliff, put him in a vat of poisonous snakes, scorpions, you know, mosquitoes like that, did black arts, black mantras, put, you know, did everything. Put him under boulders, lock him in a cave, everything possible to kill his son. But at the end, when the Supreme Lord, you know, the Shimade, his appearance day, is, when he comes, will be happening very soon. Uh, I think on May the 4th this year is his appearance day, on a Thursday. When he comes to the pillar, he kills his father. He kills Renikashiku. So after the killing, he asks, what 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 wound would you like, my dear son? You know? And he says, My dear Lord, you know, I want nothing but I want to deliver this from my father. So imagine you know, someone who completely tortured you, but you're asking, you know, please prevent my father from going to the house plants. Please forgive him. And please take him back to God. And because of that, being pure devotee, the Lord had to fulfill his wish. So he went back to God. Went back to God. So Vinay Kashipu, the worst of all demons, went back to God. Next slide, please. Um, someone would like to read this. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, would someone like to say this, this verse? Or this purport? part? Thus he comes himself, or spends his devotees, and his servants and his servants to fulfill his desire, to have all the fallen souls come back home, back to Godhead. Oh, that's it. Jai. Shri Mati Rastu, Shri Mati Next slide, please. So why is this important to us? Because, as we said earlier, it is not possible to execute devotional service. Now, what do I mean by devotional service? Devotional service simply means that we serve without any, you know, any personal desire for self sense gratification. We simply serve because we're asked to serve the devotees and the Supreme Lord. So it's not possible to execute devotional service unless we have genuine compassion. Not artificial, but genuine compassion. That is, what is it for me? If you're thinking about what is it in for me, then it becomes artificial. But what is it in for that person you're serving and what will please the Lord? 
That is called genuine compassion. And many, many times in our tradition, called the Godia Vishnu Sampadaya tradition, which comes under the, you know, the umbrella, it's coming from Lord Stanya. Lord Stanya is Supreme Sali Bhara, who appeared over 500 years ago in India, in West Bengal. Not only this Peter Sally got it, he came to teach us one thing, and that is how to engage ourselves in bhakti. And a very important level of bhakti is called compassion. Okay? So, Chidira Prabhu said this verse Jiva Dwai Ma Puruchi Vishnu Seva, Ihya Cha Dharma, Nahi Shuna Sanatana. His first disciple is Sanatana Goswami, then Rupa Goswami. So he told Sanatana Goswami, you know, Jiva Dwaya Na Puruchi. Vishnu Sevana. He says that Ihar Jat Dharma. That is, there is no Dharma. There is no higher duty than these three things. And Dharma is incomplete without these three things. What are these three things? That is having compassion for the soul, says right there. Compassion for all living beings, tasting the holy name, and serving the Vaishnavas. That is Dharma. Okay? That is real Sanatana Dharma, according to the Supreme Personality Godhead. And if you're actually looking for where this is from, you won't be able to find it. Okay? It was said, but it's actually not being recorded. However, according to Bhaksa, the source of the Goswami Maharaj, the spiritual master show Prabhupada, you can find it in the first part of the first purport of Ali Khan of the Chidei Bhagavad. So if you want to look for the reference, it's right there. But you cannot actually find where that verse comes from. So presumably, we spoke in a conversation with Sanatana Goswami like that. But the point is that that is real Dharma. Okay, that is real Dharma. Someone asks you, what is real Dharma? The answer is right there. And the authority is none other than the Supreme Personality God. So, now before we get to the next verse, the, the important thing is that there is a verse that Chidamapu also explained to Sanatana Goswami. Nitya Siddha Krishna Pema Shadi Kavunai Shavan Adi Shri Tate Raya Dai. That's Nitya Siddha, that is. It is an established fact, it is an eternal fact that all of you, that are not just human beings, but everyone, all the entities, have something called the pure love of God, Krishna Pema. It is within us. Sadhya means that it is not obtainable from, from any of the source. If you look for it anywhere else, it is not attainable. But how can you naturally awaken it? In the cry of God, how can you awaken it? By doing Shravanadi. By Shravanadi, like we just did. Before class, we do kirtan. What does that do? That purifies our heart. You know, Shuddha Jate. Then we can understand how we can awaken this dormant love for the Supreme Personality of God, to Shamanadi, through hearing, chanting, and other things, not in the devotional service. So that's the process that Shiva Prabhupada has given us. Now, getting to this verse, Shuddha Bhakta Chavna Reno, Bajanana Kula, Bhakta Seva Parana Siddhi, Vela Bhati Karamula. Okay? So you recognize this because this is a verse or a bhajan written by Bhakta Thakur. They often sing on the time of the Kadashi, you know, because later explains the glories of Kadashi. What it says is that these three things, you know, Shuddha Bhakta Chanda the the dust of the lotus feet of pure devotees, Bhajana Adakula, that is enthusiastic devotion service, and the third thing is Bhakta Seva. What are these? These are the highest forms of the, the creeper. This the devotional service is like a plant that when you sow it in your heart, it forms a plant that goes to these three personality God to the rest of the people three personality God. So my dear friends, this is the secret of success in emotional service. If you do these three things, the serving the devotees, you surely go back to God. Okay? That's proof right there in point two, but we know talk word. Another authority is Shivawan. So we also had the uh, you know Shivratri, just uh, I think about uh, yeah, it's almost a month ago or so now, Shivratri. And there uh, Shivavan says a very important verse of Parvati, you know, he says, Aradhanam Savishna Vishnu Aradhanam Ram Tasma Pradhan Devi Tadyams Archana. What does he mean by that? He says that Aradhanam, Aradhanam means worship. Higher than the worship of the Devtas is the worship of Vishnu. Okay? Higher than that is the worship of the devotees of Vishnu. He says it is not Paratharam Devi. That is, yes, worship of Vishnu is good, but higher than that are the people that are connected to Vishnu. Dadiya Nam means people that are connected to Vishnu. Smarshana means that they're rigid in their devotional service. So if you serve the devotees of the Lord, the Lord Vishnu is not pleased with you. And that is according to Shivavan, who is one of the 12 authorities. 
Why is it so important? Because, you know, when we are not compassionate towards the devotees, then the Supreme Lord does not show compassion to us, okay? And the story that is oftentimes quoted happened also, you know, many, many eons ago, and that is a story where these two personalities called the Vasa Muni and Amarish Maharaj had a conflict, okay? Because of the Vasa Muni. So the Vasa Muni, as you might remember, is a very, very powerful sage. And you can also read about this in Narayan Vilchma Bhagavatam in chapter 9, chapter 4, okay? So what happened is that the Vasa Muni is, I hope he's not around here, I hope he's not here anymore, because he tends to come at the most inopportune time, okay? He's the foremost example of an Anarasyas, Aditi. You know, Aditi means at the right time, but he's Aditi, kids at the wrong time, you know? Like you're all ready to go to the Radhilatra, you know, you're getting out of the house on 10 a.m. on Saturday morning, and all of a sudden he knocks at your door. I want breakfast, you know? Oh, okay. And you're supposed to be on the uh, cart with the Jagannath, you know? This is the Rasa Muni, you cannot say no to him. So Amrish Maharaj had the same problem. Amrish Maharaj did a, did a fast on the Kalashi fast. You know, he had he fasted for one full year of Kalashi, and this day was called Vavashi. And it was a special time called the Parana time. Okay? Parana time is a time when you're supposed to break your fast. And the Rasa Muni shows up. So what to do? Well, then uh, Amrish Maharaj consulted his brahmanas and he said that if you take some water, then you will break the fast in your fast, but you'll also not disrespect him, the guest, because when the guest comes, he's supposed to feed them first. But the Rasamani being a very powerful yogi mystic, he had all the cities, all the three cities. He, he saw through his vision, you know, that Amrish Maharaj had taken some water. So not only was he hungry, but he also became very angry. And when someone is angry and hungry, you have like a hungry snake and you step on a snake, they bite you harder. So he decided to take this little, you know, hair, strand of hair from his head, and he created this very fiery demon that basically was ready to kill Amrish Maharaj, who is none other than a pure devotee of Lord Krishna. And because he's a pure devotee, you know, Vishnu sent his Sudarshan Chakra, and basically it tailgated the Vasamani all over the entire universe, okay? All over, the, there's no place in the universe in the spiritual world that the Vasamani did not go to. Sudarshan Chakra followed them. At the end, the Vasamani went to the abode of Narayan, and Narayan said, no, goodbye, I cannot wait, <laughs> you know, this is not my Mira Spekul Chani, you know, you, you go, you go and talk to uh, Amrish Maharaj and maybe I'll forgive you. So he went to Amrish Maharaj, begged for forgiveness, and the Sudarshan Chakra disappeared. So what does that mean is that when we offend Vishnu, there's many, many, you know, morals from the story, but when we offend Vishnu, just like we go back to someone, then the Supreme Lord does not feel pleased. You know, it's like disrespect. So that goes to show that example. And Shiva Prabhupada came to this place, you know, this west from the east, basically to show us compassion because of the order of his guru. In 1953, Shura Prabhupada formed this called the League of Devotees in a place called Jansi. So before this happened, before Islam was formed, it formed about 13 years before Islam. So Prabhupada was trying to create this worldwide movement of devotees in Jansi. So in this place called the Bhavan, you know, the Bhagavad Bhavan, you'll read about it in the Inarita, on Siddhi Road in Jansi, he sat down one day and came up with this you know, what are the qualities of Modi? And if you read his manifesto, or his prospectus rather, so it's called a prospectus, you see that there's parallels between Shiva what he says about the qualities of Modi's, and what are the qualities of Modi's according to? This book called the Chinese Charitamrita, written by Shilas Raj Goswami. So in that book, in the middle part of the book, Shilas Raj explains that the are six qualities of Modi. And if you, I won't read all these, but out of those six qualities, Ten of them talk about compassion, like being very kind to everyone, being flawless, very merciful and friendly. So at least a third of these rest about the nation of compassion. So what does this mean? Is that we cannot call ourselves a glory unless we exhibit some degree of compassion. That's the take home point. Next one, please. Now what is the further scripture of proof? Well, we see it in your class. Mancha Tapa Dravisha, Kapasa Nudevaja, Patita Nam Bhavadevyo, Vashnavadevyo, Namor Maha. 
opera oasis on all the glories of the Lord, poor, full of compassion, and fulfill the desires of anyone who just like desire to please, and are full of compassion for the fall, condition, souls, for all souls. That's the literal meaning of that. Vesha means one who is a person of the Lord, and a Mori Lord is called Paradokuduki, that is, he's an ocean or a sea. As many waves, as many drops in the ocean, that's how the degree of that person's compassion is. Countless compassion. There's no start, no middle, no end. So Prabhupada says, who is a Vishnava? Prabhupada says in his writings that you just have desire and peace. Whatever you desire, you will fulfill. So in the interest of time, what we'll do is we'll go through some stories. You know, little stories about what are the examples of compassion based on past, present, and future. So, being Easter Sunday, you know, Easter Sunday, what is the difference Easter Sunday? Well, that's the resurrection of Christ. Prabhupada said, when he was asked who is Jesus, he said that he is the son of the Lord. The Lord. He's a pure devotee of the Lord. So on this day, three days after Jesus was hung on the cross, he was resurrected on Easter Sunday. Okay? And he's an exemplar of compassion. You know, we cannot talk about a class of compassion without mentioning something about Jesus Christ. So, at, on Mount Sinai, he gave two stones to Moses, and on the stones he wrote what are called the Ten Commandments. The sixth commandment is that Jesus Christ said, Thou shalt not kill. Okay, so that's, that's the commandment right there. That is, we should not, you know, kill, hatia, any living entities. Okay? And then, when he was mercifully, or mercifully, sorry, put on the cross, he's put on a thorn of, you know, a, a crown of uh, nails and thorns put on his head, and he had to carry his cross up the mountain to a place called Calvary, which is called the place of skull. Then he was mercilessly, you know, by the, 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 the shoulders, the Jewish shoulders, he's put on the cross with, you know, big nails put into his hands and in his feet, and then hung down on gravity. Such a ruthless way to kill someone. You, you hang down, and it's a slow bleeding death. You know? Like that. But yet, what did he say? He said, Father, forgive them, but they do not know what they're doing. That's mentioned in uh, Matthew. Uh, so Luke. And then in, in the New Testament, in the section of the New Testament, he says, Do unto others as you do unto them. So therefore, Srila Prabhupada says that Christ was an example of compassion. Pilar Maharaj we discussed this story already. And there's also a beautiful story of Chitani Rapabu. Haridas Thakur was, just like Chitayu, he's also a pure devotee of the Supreme Prasani Godhead. And he's called Namacharya. He's the one that explained the deep meaning behind the holy name of the Lord. Now, the problem was that he, was, he came from a Muslim background. Okay? He came from a Muslim background. And because of that, he was not accepted by the local caste Muslims, nor by the local you know, Hindus. You know, they basically banished him. And what, what, what did they do to him? Is that they beat him up. They beat him up. They beat him up a hundred times in 22 marketplaces daily. So he's whipped at least 2,200 times daily in the marketplace. Now, if we were whipped maybe in two or three marketplaces, we would die. But this is Haridas Thakur. Haridas Thakur, you know, because he's chanting the holy name of the Lord, he did not die. Okay? But when he did not die, then the soldiers of the Nawab at that time became very worried. He said that the Nawab told him that he had to kill the And if you go back to our Nawab and he's still alive, they will be put in jail and he'll kill us. So they begged him to ask him, can he please die? He said, yeah, I'll die. And he died, you know? He died, and then what did he do with him? They weren't sure what to do with him because he's not a Hindu, so they can't remain him. Not he's a Muslim, so they can't bury him. So what they decided to do, the Muslims and Hindus, they threw him into the river. They said, let's just throw his body into the river. And when he went to the river, then he hit the other side of the bank, and he woke up. And they started chanting again, okay? But at the time that he left his body, because of purely chanting the holy name, the Supreme Lord himself, just like when Lord Ramachandra did the rites for Tatayu, Lord Jitin Ramapuru, in the presence of all the devotees, at that time, in Jinnapuri, you know, did the final rites for Haridas Thakur and gave him a glorious departure. So, Haridas Thakur had the chest, on his chest had the Lord's feet of the Supreme Lord, and with his eyes, things like bumblebees on the eyes of the Supreme Lord, and Ra and Haridas Mahamantra on his lips and tongue, 
he left his body, put to glorious departure, because he was sincere to see the body of his free Lord. There's another story of Vasudev Dutta, uh, which who basically said that I will take all the sins of all the living entities and please give it to me. And Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was inspired to say that because you have taken this vow, you know, I'm yours. You can do whatever you like with my body. The Supreme Lord said that he needs to in the marketplace. And that's Vasudev Dutta. So Bhakti Dhanta starts today, maybe some can read this, okay? We're just a few more minutes, uh, until 7.40, so I want to read what Bhakti Dhanta Saraswati said about Shiva Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Goswami Thakur writes in his bumper to the Chaitanya Chaitanya In the Western world, Christians believe that only their Guru, Jesus Christ, appear in this world out of a desire to suffer on behalf of the people of the world by accepting their sins. But here we see that amongst Mahaprabhu's associates, Vasudeva Dr. Thakur showed a compassion millions of times greater and more generous as he was willing to suffer in the place of all creatures in the universe. By so doing, he taught, he taught the world the unlimited nature of the Vaishnava's selfless life. Okay, the next slide, please. Um, what did you take that one? One who executes Lord Chaitanya's mission must be considered eternally liberated. He is a transcendental person and does not belong to this material world. Such a devotee is as magnanimous as Lord Chaitanya himself. Such a personality represents Lord Chaitanya because his heart is always filled with compassion for all conditioned souls. Excellent, please. So we cannot close this class without missing something but show for example of compassion. Because he's an ambassador of compassion. And if you read the Life Story Show for Bhagavad Gita, you read the, basically every page is confused with the aspect of compassion as Gita Gita. If you'd like to get the Gita Gita, you can also get it from the book stall. I'm sure someone can help you with that. And I tell you, my dear friends, that once you start reading the Gita Gita, it's very hard to put down. You know, you just want to read it over and over and over again. So Prabhupada left this piece of life in the Dhamma in 1965, who stayed at the Ravagandar temple, has any books, you know, serving the Vaishnavas. But his guru told him to come to the West at the age, you know, at, uh, and he came, you know, after the instruction given his guru, 40 plus years ago, he finally came to the West in 1965 and born the Jaladuta. Now, his story, we'll just say for a few minutes, is out of this world, you know? Imagine, yourself being almost 70 years old, your health is not so good, and you are asked to come, not now, when there is modern, you know, everything is modern, you can jump, get on a plane, go to India, get there within 16 hours easily, you know, less than 16 hours. But at that age of 70 years old, with nothing, you know, he departed on a ship called a Jalabhuta. Now this was not like your fancy princess, you know, or, or Royal Caribbean lines, it was, it was a cargo ship, okay? It was a cargo ship. What did it carry? It carried metal, it carried cargo, a piece of crap, maybe some old trucks. And he asked Muraji Desai, who was the owner of the city of steamship lines at that time, to please give me room on the Jalabhuta. Why? Because he told her, he told Sur Muraji Desai, Sumati, sorry, Sumati Muraji, the Muraji Desai is her old prime minister. Anyways, Sumati Muraji, sorry about that. So Sumati Muraji, he told, he told her, that my guru said that if you do not serve the words of a guru, then you can serve like cargo. Okay? You are not other than an un, 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 deserving cargo. So therefore, please give me a place on your cargo ship. So he went on the cargo ship, suffered two heart attacks, and finally landed in New York City. First he landed in the Commonwealth Pier, and then landed in New York City. You know, the skyline of Manhattan, like that. I think it was the 17th pier, something like that, you read in the Gita. So anyhow, Sri Prabhupada had nothing. You know, he boarded the Jalabhuta with his three volumes, the Lishma Bhagavatam, and umbrella, and just two few other belongings. But he had nothing else with him. You know, he had some oatmeal that he was making every day on the ship, and that's it, nothing else, you know? It is said that when he arrived in New York City, when he went down the plank of the ship, he did not know whether to turn left or right. But it so happened, how did he get to America? Okay? He got to America because one of his friends in Agra, named Mother Prasad Agrawal, 
had told him that his son, Gopal Agarwal, was in America, who was there as an engineer, went there in the 1950s, the married a local American lady, but unfortunately, um, you know, they got into drinking, meat eating, you know, late night parties, and so forth. And this mother, Prasad Agarwal, was worried about his son. Because, you know, they came from a traditional Hindu family. So his father was not so happy. He was worried that, you know, his son would actually break the tradition. So when Prabhupada heard that, he said, oh, your son is in America, eh? Do you mind if uh, maybe they can uh, send me a letter? You know, I can go and help your son and daughter-in-law and maybe fix the family situation. But guess what Prabhupada had? He, not only was he trying to deliver them, but also to deliver the entire world, okay? That was a ticket to get to the West. So, Mother Prasad just heard about it, but he was not interested. What happened is that a few weeks later, Prabhupada got a letter from Mother Prasad Agarwal that Sally Agarwal had gone to the U.S. Embassy and signed a declaration to sponsor him. Okay? So, Prabhupada went to the Jalabhuta and then told his son, the Dhamma Chandra, send them a letter back saying that I've come, I'm coming. So when they got the letter a couple of weeks later, and he had already was on the Jaladuta, then when Sally got the letter, she then called up Gopal Agarwal, who was at work, and said, look, the Swami's coming. You know, he's coming all of a sudden, you know? Because she had sent many letters to other Swamis, but they never came. But Shiro Prabhupada, in the right way of the 80s, very unexpectedly, came to America, to a place called Butler, Pennsylvania. How many of you have been to Butler, Pennsylvania? Actually, inside Butler, Pennsylvania. No one? Anyone? I'm sure, yes. Thank you, Prabhu. So Prabhu's gone to back from Pennsylvania. We were there in October 2016, probably we were there at that same time. And you can get a version where Prabhupada stayed in the two-story small apartment, okay? Like that in North of Pennsylvania. So they had two kids. One son was rich, I forget the other son's name. So Prabhupada arrived, this Goswami, Kitabi Swami from Radhavadam, who's passing the books in Radhavadam, comes to this Missouri town of Upper Pennsylvania. You know, in some weird clothes with a mark on his head and you know this tail, unknown to anyone, and living there. So when he arrived there, it was 4 a.m. at night time, okay? And there was no place to sleep. So Gopal said, Where would you like to sleep? He said, Oh, I'll take the couch. She slept on the couch. Prabhupada, you know, slept on the couch. This is the savior of the entire world, crouched in the couch, you know, for two weeks. What happened was the next morning when he woke up, early in the morning, they're all, all they're the family sleeping. He woke up, he went to the fridge to look for some food, and what did he find there? And he ate tea, okay? But somehow he managed to get some fruit and offered it to his guru and distributed the food to the family. Prabhupada did this for the next entire one week. And there, there was no Sanji money, no Desi Mar, nothing like that in this place, you know? Oh, this, nothing like that. You know, this was the 1960s, you know, when there was nothing like any Indian stores around there. So you got no dal, no sabji, no, you know, chawal, nothing like that for an entire week. But he was happy. He said that if I have to give him a life on this battlefield, the pleasure of my guru, I will do it. And Prabhupada did that. And then he went to New York City and the story goes on like that. So what I'm trying to say here is that Prabhupada, you know, went to extreme lengths to you know, serve as guru and to spread the mission of compassion. And to close on the next slide, three things that Prabhupada exemplifies by his compassion. Number one is that in the early days on Second uh, on Second Avenue Road, in, uh, sorry, uh, Second uh, Avenue Road, 22nd Avenue Road in New York City, you can go there where Prabhupada stayed in the devotees. He used to run the entire study program himself. It was a one man study program, okay? One man study program. What he did is that he did got all the vegetables, he cooked them, you know, he put them into plates, prepared them, fed the devotees, and then after the devotees had three or four places for shot and went home, then what he used to do at midnight, clean all the pots and stuff, you know, like that. So he did everything between the pots and the program. And then when the devotees started getting more in number, then, uh, then he told the devotees, by the way, you have to remember now, these devotees were, uh, so these real devotees were kidneys, you know. So you should take a, you know, a, a bath maybe once every week or once every two weeks. So there's something called you know, being old coming from them. So Prabhupada said, no, you must you know, go and take a shower. So he's our guru. We have to listen to our guru. So next morning, what happened? Prabhupada got up. There was a line going to the bathroom, you know? There was a line. Prabhupada could not get to the bathroom because there's 
two or three other hippies in front of him on the line. But he's in line. He said, no, I, I, I cannot break the line. I'll stay in line. And the last example of compassion is that one time, I think this is speaking by his only voice in Buffalo, they could not find Shiro Prabhupada in the Sunday feast. Where is Shiro Prabhupada? He's standing in line in this Sunday feast. He's standing in line from Shala in the Sunday feast. So the Royal Acharya, showing by example, leading by example, is standing in line. So therefore Prabhupada, you know, he walks the talk, he walks the talk. He, he basically showed by example that he's a true Acharya compassion. So if you just follow the example, I can guarantee you that surely by holding on to the lowest feet, we'll go back to God. So with that to close, this weekend program tries to follow some of the principles of Shri Prabhupada. So in this one hour, I hope I didn't bore you, but this one hour of compassion, I hope that uh, with, the, with the mercy of Shri Prabhupada and Chari, that we will feel inspired, you know, to please Shri Shri Rava, Kishra Gopina, and the Asasakis, or the altar as well, Nalita and Shaka, you don't see them in the altar. They're looking at us, they're saying how can you help us? They're asking how can you help us, these gopis, okay? So we can help them by basically signing up here on this desk and there will be people to help you, you can put your name down and then we can also guide you how this program, a week here can help you and there's some training involved as well. It's a very straightforward training but because there's some important terms, technicalities, sense of issues, medical things, it's actually very easy, you can sign up for this program and therefore you can serve your loved ones in this program called Krishna Care. So with that, we'll close and now we have a video. Thank you for giving me your kind attention. Shri Cursed 
that he will forget all his powers until somebody reminds him. And those of you who are familiar with the story of Lord Ramchandra, after the Sita had been uh, located in Lanka, somebody had to go and confirm that she's there. And it was Hanuman who had been asked to, uh, to take the task after being reminded that he has the power to jump over the ocean 800 miles long. The reason I'm bringing you that story is that I think we have all forgotten that we have the power to show compassion to our fellow human beings. And I think it has been a very wonderful reminder by Prabhuji to, to all of us that it's time to act. I'll tell you one thing from personal experience. When we act along these lines, when we show up at a hospital to read Bhagavad Gita to somebody who's about to leave his body, her body, when we show up at somebody's house who has not been getting regular food, we some prashad. When we show up to do some chanting, do some prayers to people who are about to leave their body, the expression on their faces, the expression on the faces of their relatives is unbelievable and is extremely fulfilling. And please try to sign up for this service. Do as much as you can without inconveniencing yourself too much and feel that satisfaction. Feel that feeling of fulfillment that you get from serving somebody in those situations. So, thank you very much for listening. And thank you all. Oh, one other thing I will say. Talk about compassion. This is compassion for Sunny. This all care system in Toronto runs because of her. She's the leader, she's the inspirer. She's the doer, and she leads by example. It's unbelievable. I cannot say enough. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next uh, senior devotee of our uh, team, whom you like to recognize, is His Grace Jagannath Mishra Prabhuji, who you heard just now. He's a wonderful person, always ready to guide us, give us some ideas how to run this. Anytime there is a problem, he's always there for us. Thank you so much, Prabhuji. And the next uh, member we would like to recognize is Salil Prabhu. He has been uh, serving my very Every week, twice a week, he visits her with Prashad and spends time with her shares the scriptural knowledge, shares the wonderful philosophical wisdom, and then enjoy chanting and doing things. Thank you. And uh, uh, Vaishnavaskar would also like to extend somebody who has been serving Mother Sudhudi, even though he's not part of Vaishnavaskar team, Rain or Shine or Midnight, um, His Grace Vijay Patel Prabhu, Whenever he shouts for him, he is there. So let's see him. So I'll keep the token of appreciation with me and I will see him. And the next appreciation goes to Hemanga Prabhu, who has been part of our strategic team. I'm going to hold him. Hemanga Prabhu, are you here somewhere? Thank you so very much for all the service that you do. Now we will actually introduce the strategic team. It's not a one-woman show or a one-man show, it's a team show. It's a team, basically. So we have a strategic team. I would like all the strategic team members, Hemanga Prabhu, Venkat Prabhu, please rush up, there is no time. In the interest of time, please be here.
the sponsor of today's uh, Sunday feast, whose father is seriously uh, admitted in uh, St. Joseph's Hospital. He's in ICU. So can we have the Mahamantra chanting for his father, Thiru Prabhuji? Madan Prabhu's father, Thiru Prabhuji. So we will chant for him the Hare Krishna Mahamantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Thank you very much. So we facilitate anybody who is about to leave the body, we facilitate from Vaishnava skating to chant at the time of their breath so they are consciously remembering the Lord's name and the Lord and the past time. So we read for them. So kindly come and volunteer for this wonderful service. Of course training is mandatory. There is a main training, this is a sensitive service and this compassion is required. So this is a training service, so we are here to help you and guide you. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So we'd like to thank our Be Care team for that nice presentation. I'm sure it was very informative for everyone. So just some upcoming events. So we have our upcoming Bhagavad Gita overview course, which is virtual. It'll be taking place from April 24th to May 25th. The details are available at our website, www.torontokrishna.com. Additionally, next Sunday, which is April the 16th, is Ekadasi. So um, Ekadasi comes twice a month. This is a day where uh, Vaishnavas fast from grains and beans. So next Sunday, uh, we'll be, uh, we will have, be having, we'll still be having our feast, but it'll just be a slightly modified menu. And on the subject of our feast, so as, um, as Madhaji already mentioned, we have a, uh, we have a devotee who is sponsored uh, in, for his father's health. So Madhaji Prabhu is sponsored for his father's health. Tiruguna um, Sambhanathanar. Um, so we will, the, the, the feast has been sponsored in uh, honor of his recovery. As well, we have um, Ashu Madhaji, one of our Sunday school teachers, who is sponsored on the occasion of her father, Om Prakash's 87th birthday. So we did just chant the Muhammad three times already, but we'll chant them again. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama. sponsor the, the feast as well as the garlands that are offered to the Lordships every Sunday. If you'd like any more information about that or if you'd just like to make any kind of contribution to our programs here, you can see uh, Neetu Mataji at the front desk.